All right, that's at 7 o'clock tonight. Senate is in as we speak. Thanks again. And we'll wait for this hearing to start. On your screen is Representative Tom Davis, the chairman of the House Government Reform Committee, where in just a couple of minutes they'll be holding a hearing to examine social, economic, and health issues facing black men. That hearing should get underway shortly. Prior to that, they have some preliminary unrelated business that they'll finish up, some votes on wireless privacy, child support enforcement, and drinking water standards. This is a, a live picture from the Rayburn House office building on Capitol Hill. The House itself has finished its legislative work for the week. Members return Monday at noon Eastern for a pro forma session, a time when members may introduce bills and make speeches. Government reform uh, will come to order. Uh, committee meets today to hold an oversight hearing on black men and boys in the District of Columbia and their impact on the future of the black family. Prior to the hearing, the committees could hold a very brief business meeting. The committee will consider the following bills. House Concurrent Resolution 71, introduced by Congressman Charles Rangel of New York, recognized the importance of Ralph Bunch as one of the great leaders of the United States, the first African-American Nobel Peace Prize winner, an accomplished scholar, a distinguished diplomat, and a tireless campaigner of civil rights for people throughout the world. House Concurrent Resolution 262, introduced by myself, expresses the sense of Congress in support of the national anthem Sing America Project, coordinated by the National Association for Music Education, the Smithsonian Institution, and the American Sportscasters Association. The Sing America Project intends to renew the national awareness of the patriotic musical traditions of the United States. House Resolution 262, introduced by Chairman Platts of the Government Efficiency Subcommittee, supports the goals and ideals of Pancreatic Cancer Awareness Month. Pancreatic cancer has the highest mortality rate of all cancers at nearly 99 percent and infects over 30,000 Americans each year. House Resolution 306, sponsored by Congressman Jose Serrano of New York, congratulates the New York Yankees on the occasion of their 100th anniversary. In January 1903, two New York businessmen purchased the defunct Baltimore Orioles franchise for $18,000. The team moved to Manhattan and was renamed the Highlanders. Eventually becoming the Yankees and moving to storied Yankee Stadium in the Bronx, the team has won 26 World Series, more than any other team in Major League Baseball history. House Resolution 352, introduced by Congressman Sanford Bishop, remembers and honors the March on Washington, August 28, 1963. On this date, nearly 250,000 people gathered at the Lincoln Memorial to protest the lack of civil rights for minorities in America and listen to the Reverend Martin Luther King deliver his famous I Have a Dream speech. 
H.R. 1882, introduced by Congresswoman Corrine Brown of uh, Florida, designates the facility of the U.S. Postal Service located at 440 South Orange Blossom Trail in Orlando, Florida, as the Arthur Pappy Kennedy Post Office. Mr. Kennedy was a tireless public advocate and the first black city commissioner in Orlando's history. H.R. 1883, also sponsored by Congresswoman Brown, designates the facility of the U.S. Postal Service located at 1601 dash 1 Main Street in Jacksonville, Florida as the Eddie May Stewart Post Office. Eddie May Stewart was the Florida State President of the NAACP and was a leader in the effort to desegregate the Duval County Public Schools. H.R. 2452, introduced by the gentleman from New York, Congressman Peter King, designates the facility of the U.S. Postal Service located at 339 Hicksville Road in Bethpage, New York as the Brian C. Hickley Post Office Building. Captain Hickey was uh, Fire Department of New York's Rescue 4 and was killed while bravely struggling to save victims during September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks. And finally, H.R. 2826, introduced by uh, Delegate Annabel Acevedo Villa, designates the facility of the U.S. Postal Service located at 1000 Avienda Sanchez Osorio in Carolina, Puerto Rico as the Roberto Clemente Walker Post Office Building one of Major League Baseball's greatest sluggers ever. Roberto Clemente was the first Latin American enshrined in the Baseball Hall of Fame. I'd now like to recognize the uh, very distinguished uh, gentlelady from the District of Columbia for any statement she may wish to make. Uh, no, no, no statement, Mr. Chairman. Well, given the time constraints, I would ask that members submit their written statements for the record. Uh, I'll hold the record open until the end of the day to accommodate any members who may not have prepared written statements. I ask unanimous consent that the Committee on Government Reform support House Concurrent Resolution 71, House Concurrent Resolution 262, House Resolution 262, House Resolution 306, House Resolution 352, H.R. 1882, H.R. 1883, H.R. 2452, and H.R. 2826 to the House with the recommendation that these bills and resolutions do pass. Any member wish to speak on the unanimous consent request? Without objection, the unanimous consent request is agreed to. Uh, the business meeting is now adjourned and the committee will reconvene. Now we move. Some of them might let go without even S, but you want yeah. to. <laughs> All right, we have our distinguished panel up. <coughs> The committee will reconvene, come back to order, and today's hearing is on black men and boys in the District of Columbia and their impact on the future of the black family. Although we've seen some remarkable progress over the past several decades, uh, there remain significant socioeconomic gaps between African Americans and other eth ethnicities. Our hearing today will address matters of particular concern to African American males in the District of Columbia and other metropolitan areas. The statistics are startling. African American males are seven times more likely to be murdered than their Caucasian counterparts. The African American rate of HIV AIDS infection is five times higher than that of Caucasians. African Americans comprise 38 percent of AIDS cases reported to the U.S. Center for Disease Control. The unemployment rate for African Americans is at 10.1 percent. These statistics should concern us all. I hope our witnesses will be able to shed some light on their underlying causes and what the public and private sectors can do about it. How can we expect African American males to dream high when they are fraught with disappointment, with violence and low expectations? Now, obviously, we can't. I hope to see increased opportunities for the participation of African Americans in the political process as voters and candidates. There are countless African American men with the potential to become leaders of the District of Columbia and cities and states across the country, but too few of them get to the point where they can exercise that potential. It is important for the community and the government to foster an environment in which they can succeed and positively influence the course of events pertinent to African Americans and all of us. We have to remember that the boys of today will become tomorrow's fathers. It is our goal to identify problems affecting African Americans, build awareness of these issues. I applaud the efforts of the Commission and hope today's hearing will, benefit the, uh, will help the Commission develop an action plan that will benefit the African American community. I also want to particularly thank Congresswoman Norton for her work with the District of Columbia Commission on Black Men and Boys and other issues in the city. She has taken a leadership role in this. Now, we have a distinguished panel of witnesses before us today, and I look forward to hearing their testimony from our witnesses. I thank you for sharing uh, your experiences and suggestions with us. Uh, I also uh, welcome uh, 
today's, everyone to today's hearing. I look forward to your testimony. I want to now recognize uh, Mrs. Norton for an opening statement. And again, uh, thank you for uh, bringing this before us. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, indeed, I, I want to begin by saying uh, how grateful I am to my good friend Tom Davis uh, for agreeing to this hearing, for putting his staff to work on preparations, and of course to the majority staff for their assistance. My special thanks as well to the staff of Ranking Member Henry Waxman. Representative Waxman, Waxman's able staff has devoted many hours of splendid expert effort to the work of the D.C. Commission on Black Men and Boys and to securing a particularly outstanding group of witnesses for today's hearing. This hearing springs from the groundbreaking efforts of a different kind of commission. The D.C. Commission on Black Men and Boys consists of African-American men with special credibility with black men and boys in the District of Columbia. This commission, in, in its composition and its dedicated work, has made the point that leadership to resolve the issues facing black males must begin with black men themselves. The commission has been ably assisted by an advisory board of eight very distinguished experts who have added a wealth of invaluable knowledge and assistance to the Commission's work. I would like to note the presence of uh, one of the Commissioners, all of the Commissioners, I, I, I want to be quick to say, have their day jobs and so have, have therefore been volunteers in the work with the Commission. But one of the Commissioners besides uh, the distinguished Chair, Mr. Stark, is here and I'd like to ask him and one of the Advisory Commissioners is here, uh, Mr. Larry Quick. Would you stand? Uh, and uh, of the Advisory Commission, Dr. Mark Turner, would you stand? And I appreciate very much the work that you and the other commissioners and advisory board members have done. Thank you very much. A major difference this commission brings is its action orientation. Generally, commissions make their contribution through important recommendations. But when it comes to black men and their relationship to black family life today, it is much too late for recommendations. The issues are so urgent that they need to be addressed for immediate action by our country and city in general and by the African American community in particular. I will not rehearse the many problems that need attention. The statistics in and of themselves are so unbearable. They simply must not be allowed to get any worse. The 50% of U.S. prisoners who are black males, although black males are only 6% of the total U.S. population, for example, or the most heartbreaking of all, the 70% of black children born to never married women, therefore assuring a childhood of poverty for many. We have been focused on the symptoms of the decline of black family life, how to improve poor performance in school or to reduce juvenile crime, for example, knowing full well that children from intact families are far less likely to have these or other problems. We are centered largely on the symptoms because we have not figured out a way to get a hold of one of the primary causes, the large, an awesome problem of family dissolution at its roots. This problem is particularly <laughs> frightening because it is global and because of its necessary effects on children. In American society, family decline is further along in black America, but it is spreading at lightning speed to white and Hispanic Americans as well. The Commission is suggesting that one important way to get a hold of black family deterioration is to take on issues of facing black, facing black men and boys in work and preparation for work, in pursuit of education, in incarceration, in reentry from prison, in juvenile justice, and in the perils of street life to boys and young men. This, of course, is a tall order. However, it is easier than dealing 
only with the devastating consequences to African-American boys and men, to their families, to the black community, and to our country. It is easier than sitting and watching a generation of attractive, well-educated young African-American women who may never marry and have families before, because comparable young black men were diverted as youths into, the street, into street life, crime, and prison. It is easier than tackling the worst effects of all, the permanent damage to an entire innocent generation of black children. And it is easier than seeing the end of the African-American community as we have known it, where mothers and fathers together have always forged a better life for their children, notwithstanding the burdens of racism and discrimination. An important reason for focusing on black males is that family deterioration began with problems that directly affected black men in particular. The rapid flight of decent paying manufacturing jobs beginning in the 1960s correlates <coughs> almost exactly with black family decline. Men without jobs do not form families. The drug economy, the underground economy, and the gun economy all moved in to African American communities to replace the, the legitimate jobs of the traditional economy. Jobs and education are critical cornerstones. With all the rhetoric among government officials about family values, government has failed to focus on how decent jobs almost automatically lead young men to pursue marriage and family life. However, the black community cannot depend on macro solutions alone because they take time and time is not on our side. Indeed, time has run out. Thus, the Commission is right to address its action mandate across the board, and not only to government that is responsible for delivering change in a democratic society. Recognizing what is at stake, the Commission has said it will address its action plan to all the sectors that must take responsibility for short and long-term solutions, including parents and educators, business and labor, and community and neighborhoods. The Commission will use the very successful local hearings it has held, all very well attended uh, from the community of residents of the district, will use its work with the nation's preeminent African-American think tank, the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies, and will use today's hearing to prepare its action plan to be presented in a formal ceremony to Mayor Tony Williams, City Council Chair Linda Kropp, Superintendent Paul Vance, of business and labor leaders, and representatives of community and nonprofit organizations. For this reason, I am especially grateful to today's witnesses. The issues before the Commission on Black Men and Boys need the thoughtful, problem-solving work associated with each of their careers. The testimony our witnesses will offer today is critical to the more urgent and concentrated search for answers and actions that have eluded the larger society as much as they have eluded our city. I thank our witnesses for the effort they have put into preparation of their testimony, and I very much look forward to hearing from each of them today. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you very much. And now we move uh, basically to center stage here. We have a, really an all-star cast in front of us. Our panel is George Stark from the D.C. Black Men and Boys uh, Commission, Charles Mann from the Good Samaritan Foundation, Dr. William uh, Julius Wilson from uh, Harvard University, Paul Quander, the Court Services and Offender Supervision Agency, Dr. Jay Cummings from Texas Southern University, and uh, Robin Guathme from Rutgers University. It is a policy of this committee that all witnesses be sworn before you testify. So if you would uh, rise with me and raise your right hand. You uh, solemnly swear the testimony you are about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. 
Thank you. Mr. Stark, I'm going to start with you. I just I had Wes Unseld in this position one time, sworn before the committee uh, when he was with the uh, and then the Bullets, and I asked him under oath if the Bullets were going to have a winning season. And, and, and under oath he said, well, I can promise you exciting basketball. Uh, we could have held him in contempt that year, but we, we let it slide. He was trying. But we're happy to have you here, and thanks for all your work. There's a oh, button there. Yeah, okay. Great, thanks. Um, I am the chairman of the Commission on uh, Black Men and Boys in the District of Columbia, and also the founder of the Excel Institute, which is uh, an academic and, and technical uh, uh, job job facility, and, and we focus specifically on automotive automotive technology. A as such, and, and also obviously being a black man, I, I think. Uh, I'm qualified to, 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 to be a witness here. And, and I, I was thinking how I was going to begin my talk, and, and the Congress lady always looks to me to, to do something interesting. And I was thinking just now, when you were speaking, Ms. Norton, that my father died about six months ago. I'm 55 years old. And the truth is, I miss him every day. And I think about the leadership and guidance I got from him that I miss today. I'm 55, and I'm a relatively successful person. I've been to Super Bowls and I've started companies and I've run companies and I run an institution. You know, how then can we expect an 11 year old boy to make it? You know, at, where the upshot of the commission hearings and the commission meetings and, 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 and my experience in, in the neighborhoods and my growing up is, is what we probably all could have figured out without any of that is that. We have a, just a tremendous volume of young people who didn't do well in school because they didn't go to school because when they were 11 years old, they had no father and mother to say, go to school. They had a mother for sure, but the absence of, of fathers you know, for, uh, around in our neighborhoods and, and for our young people has just been devastating. And, and so what happens? And so then you have people drop out of school and then they drop out of school and at some point they need to make money to take their girlfriend to the movies or to eat or whatever. And, Without any education, they end up usually in the drug business. And then with the drug business comes violence and death, and it probably incarceration if they don't get shot. And, and it's a cycle which we're all well aware of, which, which I thought you've outlined very clearly. The question then is, is what to do with it? What do we do with where we are? You know, it's, it's clear that, you, that leadership is important on an individual level, and therefore that brings you to mentoring. There's got to be a way. That, that we can institute formally some kind of mentoring ability for our young people that are, that are leaderless, because it just, you know, there has to be a way to do that, and that's, that's one of the findings of the Commission, of course. And then, of course, there's the issue of education and jobs. When, uh, when I had retired from football, I went into the automobile business, and, and I, I built a company in Maryland called George Stark Ford. One of my biggest difficulties and the biggest difficulties in the automobile industry is finding trained technicians. While I was scrambling around trying to find trained technicians, which was difficult, uh, you keep reading the paper about 10 kids shooting another 10 kids in Washington, D.C. And my feeling at the time was, which has been borne out, is that a lot of the violence in Washington is specifically job related. It's a job issue. It's not really a crime issue. And you know, to put people in jail, it doesn't solve the job issue. It, it's about training. So I'm one of 2,000 car dealerships around Washington. We can't, none of us can find techs. You have this large unskilled labor pool in Washington. As everybody knows, what I did is I sold my companies and, and I built the Excel Institute. And in fact, we have, a, pro, we have a, a highly successful venture for anyone above the age of 16. Washington, of course, has a literacy issue. So if you have to address that as part of your education, so we're, we're academic for those of if you can't read, you can come to us. We teach you to read and write, and you get your GED. At the same time, we teach a trade that we know has 100 percent placement. Not only is it placing 100 percent of the people, but also it's a good job. You can buy a house, buy a car, build a family. It's not a, you know, so technicians make a lot of money. And so it's a coupling of academic and the technical, which allows us to do what we do best, which is fill that specific job niche in the Washington area. Uh, most you have to be 16 to come to us, as I said earlier. And uh, but you'd be surprised. We we feel whether you're 16 or 17 or 20 or 25, that that need for family leadership is still there. So 
the Excel Institute sort of accidentally became sort of the, the local parent for a lot of our people. We have, we have about 150 students. Nobody pays any money. It's a two-year program. It's like a junior college. And um, so I, I think that if, if when we look at the problem in Washington specifically, I think the issue of, of leadership on an individual level, which would be mentorship, but at the end of the day, it does come back to jobs and the ability to, to make money and build a family for those, because otherwise you end up in jail and then coming out. You know, the, Mr. Kwanda is going to speak here from CSOSA. You know, you have, you have a lot of men coming back to Washington, D.C. who have been incarcerated. And they're coming back the same way they left. You know, they couldn't read when they left. They had no skills when they left. They've been incarcerated for however the hell long it is. And they're coming back the same way they left. So, number one, I think on a federal level, we need to consider some kind of education program for those guys or gals who are incarcerated so they don't come back the same way they left, that, that they can come back and provide for their families if they have one, or, or not find themselves in a situation that puts them back in jail. So um, thank you. That's, that's, that's my initial statement. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Mann? Well, first of all, First of all, thank Let you. Let me just explain, and, and George kept his time. The green light you have gives you basically five minutes. It, after okay. four minutes, it turns orange, and we try to keep it five. We'll give you a okay. little. It's an sure. important issue, so if you need extra time. But okay. Thank all you. Right. Thank Start. you. I thought you were taking some of my time. No. No, we just started you again. All I'm right. not messing thank with you. you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, for, first, for uh, having me here. I take it very seriously, the issue, um, having lived in this skin and being a black man for 42 years. Um, I, uh, I look at every opportunity as an opportunity to further the cause of people, but in, in, my, in this case, uh, black men and boys. Um, overcoming obstacles to success, young black men and boys need role models. Those role models need to not be on the various fields of play. They need to be in the homes. They need to be in the classrooms. They need to be in the neighborhoods. Um, I'm not talking about uh, um, a role model such as uh, uh, these athletes. And, and, and being a former athlete, I, I understand what that means. I'm, I'm saying that we need to have fathers and um, and businessmen and, and people like that give of their time and of their lives to help pull up these young, these young people. Uh, and, and there I'm talking about all people, not just black people. They need to be mentored by men of integrity, people with moral character, people with strong spiritual foundations, because this is what we're dying of as, as you know, we look at uh, separation of church and state. We're looking at taking God out of uh, everything. Um, that's what this country was founded on. The money we spend has in God we trust. We need to get back to having a firm spiritual foundation. And when we ask these young black men and boys to turn from something, we have to have them turn to something. So we're asking them to turn from a life of crime. They've, they've got to have something substantial to turn to. Jesus is the rock. That is the foundation that we need to perform or, or encourage these young men and boys to go to. They need to turn to something like that. Daryl Green, having a 20-year successful career, uh, Art Monk, some of, the, some of my heroes, all these guys, what makes them different from some of the other athletes that you see out there is these guys are grounded and rooted in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That's the difference. They were great football players or great stars or whatever, but it's the moral character, the integrity that is found in Jesus Christ. So I need to get that out. All right, I got two minutes. Um, I just told Ms. Norton I'd give you more time oh. talking that way. That's Thank you. And, and, and what are some of the Ms. Ms. Norton is very interested in how God helps those who help themselves and in your program. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate that. And you've been a big advocate of the Good Samaritan Foundation, and I really appreciate that. What are some of the particular challenges these boys and young men face? First of all, lack of opportunities. Uh, I'm not 
you know, saying anything earth shattering there, but there's lack of opportunities, stereotypes. Um, you have, a, and to this day, um, and, I'll, and I'll change it a little bit, my wife will walk into Nordstrom's. I've been married for 19 years, uh, one woman. Uh, we have three children. Uh, but my wife will walk into Nordstrom's with some jeans and a t-shirt on, and she won't be helped. She's just looking. She doesn't have the wherewithal to buy, so salespeople overlook her. Then I walk in with her, and now they're falling all over us. And my wife wonders, well, she doesn't wonder why. She knows why. But that's not right. These preconceived notions, these stereotypes, you know, um, walk up on somebody, uh, me as a black man walk up on somebody in the evening to say hi or, or go to my car, and I frighten people because I'm a black man and, you know, that means that you got to watch out. It's, a sh it's, it's sad, but I have three children who, are, uh, who have been born and raised in the suburbs. When we go into the inner city, my kids are somewhat frightened at times when they see a group of black men and boys. And that's, and that's in my own family because the stereotypes. Um, distractions in the community and in the environment. These kids, these young black men and boys, grow up with death and violence all around them, killings on their doorstep. Then the pressure, the peer pressure. Yeah, we all know about peer pressure, but guess what? We have a different peer pressure. A black man isn't supposed to be smart, and he's getting that pressure from his other black men friends and boys you're not supposed to be smart. Why are, you, why are you working real hard in school? Why are you going to do that? You ain't going to get a job. The man ain't going to give you a job. So why are you doing it? So there's pressure right from them not to succeed and be successful. How do we prepare these young men and boys for post-secondary education and or entry into the workforce? Well, the Good Samaritan Foundation uh, does a walkthrough uh, of the college application process. We teach uh, them how to research their schools of interest. We have college fairs and tours. We have college mentors come back and talk to these uh, kids and tell them about the pitfalls and the struggles that are out there. We assist them in finding scholarship opportunities, career preparatory workshops, self-assessments to find their interests and then find the careers that match those interests. We also do cover letter writing and resume writing seminars. We do job shadowing. We, anytime you all have some job shadowing opportunities open here, we'd love to put some of our kids to work right here. And we do internships. A recommendation I would have is that the government do a better job of partnering with, with groups that want to provide training that leads to opportunity, employment opportunities. We've got to make ourselves more available. Um, the jobs are here. We just need to give these young black men and boys opportunities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Wilson, thanks for being with us. Uh, Congressman Davis, uh, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to uh, address this committee. And I would like to uh, congratulate uh, Congresswoman Norton for establishing the Commission on Black Men and Boys. Uh, I think she is a real visionary, and I hope that her efforts uh, represent a major step toward addressing a serious domestic problem, the social and economic decline of African American males. Now, in my presentation, I would like to focus particularly on the employment woes of low-skilled black males. And since my presentation is restricted to five minutes, um, I refer you to a larger written statement uh, that I have submitted. In the last three decades, low-skilled African-American males have encountered increasing difficulty gaining access to jobs, even menial jobs. And although the employment 
and wages of all low-skilled workers improved during the economic boom period of the late 1990s and into 2000. The country is now in a jobless recovery following the 2001 recession. Jobless rates, especially those in the inner city, are on the rise again. The ranks of idle street corner men have swelled since the early 1970s and include a growing proportion of adult males who routinely work in and tolerate low-wage jobs when they are available. Now, what has caused the deterioration in the employment prospects of low-skilled black males? Although blacks continue to confront racial barriers in the labor market, many inner-city African-American workers have been victimized by the decreased relative demand for low-skilled labor. The computer revolution, that is the spread of new technologies, is displacing low-skilled workers and rewarding the more highly trained. And the growing internationalization of economic activity has increasingly pitted low-skilled workers in the United States against low-skilled workers around the world. And one of the legacies of historic racism in America is a disproportionate number of African-American workers who are unskilled. Accordingly, the decreased relative demand for low-skilled labor has had a greater adverse impact on blacks than on whites. In addition, over the past several decades, black males have been displaced disproportionately from the manufacturing sector, a trend that has continued up to today as black males have lost more than 300,000 manufacturing jobs since 2001. The sharpest job loss in percentage term, a manufacturing job loss in, per in percentage terms of any ethnic group. Today, most of the new jobs for workers with limited education and experience are in the service sector, which hires relatively more women. The movement of lower skilled men, including black men, into this growth sector of the economy has been slow. For inner city black male workers, the problems created by the decreased relative demand for labor have been aggravated by negative employer attitudes. Research reveals that employers generally consider inner city black males to be either uneducated, un uncooperative, unstable, or dishonest. Unfortunately, the negative effects of employer perceptions of inner city black males have been compounded by the restructuring of the economy. The increasing shift to service industries has resulted in the greater demand for workers who can effectively serve and relate to the consumer. Many employers feel that unlike women and immigrants who have recently expanded the labor pool in the low wage service sector, Inner city black males lack such qualities. Consequently, their rejection in the labor market gradually grows over time. The more these men complain or manifest their job dissatisfaction, the less attractive they seem to employers. They therefore encounter greater discrimination when they search for employment and clash more often with supervisors when they are hired. The expressed feelings of many inner city black males about their jobs and job prospects reflect their plummeting position in a changing economy. Continuing lack of success in the labor market reduces the ability of many inner city fathers to adequately support their children, which in turn lowers their self-confidence as providers and creates antagonistic relations with the mother of their children. Convenient rationalizations shared and reinforced by the men and by, by men in these restrictive economic situations emerge that reject the institution of marriage in ways that enhance, not diminish, their self-esteem. The outcome is a failure to meet the societal norms of fatherhood. <coughs> Programs that focus on the cultural problems pertaining to fatherhood without confronting the broader and more fundamental issues of restricted economic opportunities have limited chances to succeed. In my view, the most effective fatherhood programs in the inner city 
will be those that address attitudes, norms, and behaviors in combination with local and national attempts to improve job prospects. Only then will fathers have a realistic chance to adequately care for their children and envision a better life for themselves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, Mr. Quander, thank you for being with us. Chairman Davis, Councilwoman, Congresswoman Norton, good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on this important topic, which is of vital interest to me as a third generation citizen of the District of Columbia, a father, a public servant, and an African American. My name is Paul Quander, and I'm the director of the Court Services and Offender Supervision Agency for the District of Columbia. This agency provides community supervision for individuals on pretrial detention, probation, parole, and supervised release. Our mission is to reduce recidivism and to protect the public through effective supervision practices. CSOSA, my agency, supervises over 20,000 people each year, almost all of them over 94 percent are African-American males. We cannot speak of the difficulties facing African-American men and boys in this city without speaking of the criminal justice system. This is particularly true here in the district. The Washington Post reported in 1997 that nearly half of the city's black men between the ages of 18 and 50 were either involved with or being pursued by the criminal justice system. Nationally, the rate of involvement is about one-third. The District of Columbia, which has by far the highest incarceration rate in the country, has an even higher rate of incarcerating black men. Among the problems young black men face in our city, that is, that is surely one of the most significant. It is far more likely today that a black male student in the District of Columbia public schools will graduate to prison rather than graduate from college. Most of us here today have heard these statistics before. In my former job as an assistant United States attorney, I contributed to them. During my eight years at the U.S. Attorney's Office, I prosecuted and successfully convicted many African-American defendants who were involved in criminal activities. Although I believe that doing the time was just a just and logical consequence of doing the crime, I know incarceration damaged the lives of individuals and the families that these men left behind. Now I lead CSOSA's workforce of more than 300 community supervision officers who work directly with offenders to correct the personal and social damage caused by a criminal lifestyle. We do that by enforcing strict accountability standards and in the process affecting behavioral change. Our strategy is to combine accountability with opportunity, not just to tell the offender that life can be different, but to show him how he can create those differences for himself. It isn't easy. On average, an offender who reaches our supervision has been arrested six times and convicted three. He is very likely to have a history of substance abuse and much less likely to have received any treatment. Chances are about even that he completed high school. Even if he did, he has few marketable job skills and a poor work history. Sadly, many of our offenders have had far too much exposure to a life on the wrong side of the law. D.C.'s high incarceration rate has often resulted in generations of the same family being in prison simultaneously. During my tenure as the Deputy Director of the District of Columbia Department of Corrections, it was not uncommon to have fathers and sons, and occasionally even grandsons, incarcerated in different institutions at the Lawton Correctional Complex. Even more common were large numbers of Lawton inmates who had grown up together and attended the same schools. Over the years, a stint at Lawton became a sort of rite of passage within some of the city's more economically depressed neighborhoods. Too many of the district's youth have had no personal experience of a man who works every day at Giant Food or the post office, pays his bills, takes care of his family, and gets true satisfaction from simply doing the right thing. Too few of these adolescents have had the benefit of a coach, a teacher, a minister, or a neighbor who touches their lives by example. One young man, a participant in our faith-based mentoring program, told me recently 
that he just never had anyone in his life to show him the right way. Many of our offenders never learned the discipline required to work by holding a summer job. They never participated in a youth sports program to expose them to leadership, teamwork, and fair play. Instead, they hung out on the streets. Their fathers were often absent, their mothers overwhelmed, and the public institutions that were supposed to look out for their welfare were crippled by lack of resources. The great scholar of American democracy, Alexis de Tocqueville, believed that our society's strength lay in its defense of the individual's right to define his own community. Tocqueville wrote, in democratic countries, knowledge of how people combine is the mother of all forms of knowledge. On its progress depends that of all others. Each community defines its own norms through the groups into which citizens divide themselves, the family, congregations, political parties, clubs, etc. The result of this free association is not only the individual's investment in his community's success, but the community's careful nurturing of its individual members. But free association is not always positive association. In so many cases, our young men seeing no legitimate role for themselves in the mainstream community have developed their own communities with their own antisocial norms and standards of behavior. Membership in these clubs is very costly, not just to the youth who join them, but to all of us. The individual surrenders his hopes, his dreams, and often his liberty. He ends up incarcerated or on C. Sosa's caseload. Society pays in fear, mistrust, and the social and material consequences of crime. C. Sosa's approach to supervision requires that the offender disassociate from the negative community that, he may, that may have led him into trouble. At the same time, we attempt to establish new bonds between the offender and positive social institutions. We do this in two ways, by enforcing account accountability, which reduces the risk to reoffend and by introducing the offender to people and institutions who contribute to this city's well-being rather than detract from it. Our community supervision officers work directly with residents, employers, and educational and faith institutions, inviting them to embrace the offenders among them and give them a hand in rejoining society. That may be charity, but it's also good public safety practice. The more invested the community is in an individual, the more obstacles it's going to be put between that individual and self-destruction. Many of us grew up in neighborhoods where everyone knew whose child we were, and every one of our neighbors would tell our parents if, if they saw us doing something wrong. See, social vision isn't that different. Over the past 18 months, we have matched over 100 returning offenders with mentors from this city's faith institutions. The mentors are often older, retired men and women who want to give of themselves. One mentor is a school custodian who has raised five children. When he was asked why he chose to become a mentor, he answered, I guess I know something about helping young men avoid prison. All of my boys are doing well. I like to help a few other boys do well as well. Mentors like him provide the guidance and tough love many of our offenders have never known. They help to develop the empathy that our offenders have never had. We are grateful to them and for them. Criminal supervision is rarely a lifelong relationship. Within a few months or a few years, the offender no longer has to answer to us. It is our fervent hope that by the time his supervision ends, he will have learned that he always has to answer to the community. For the most part, C. Sosa's supervision is effective at safeguarding the public. Of all the arrests in Washington last year, only about 13 percent involved offenders under our supervision. But as you know, most crime is committed by individuals known to the system but who are not on supervision. For that reason, we try to involve the community in the offender's success so that accountability remains long after we're out of the picture. I wish C. Sosa only supervised a few hundred individuals because only a few hundred individuals needed supervision. But until many things change, the criminal justice system will remain too big a part of the lives of this city's black men and boys. The very least we can do for them is to recognize that unless we connect them to the community, the criminal justice system will be the only community that they know. Thank you again for the opportunity to appear before you and to offer this testimony to you today. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much as well. Um, Dr. Cummings, thanks for being with us. Good morning, uh, Chairman Davis, Congresswoman Norton, and all gathered here. 
Uh, it's a good, good opportunity and a pleasure for me to be able to provide this testimony. Uh, before I get into my uh, prepared text, I'd like to give you a little bit of background on why I make these comments. Uh, I'm 61. I have six children, four boys. I have two grandchildren, one is a male. Uh, I'm responsible for uh, the policy making in Texas regarding equity of, of for 600,000 African American students in the public school system. And I've been the president of the National Association for State Directors of Career and, Techno and Technical Education. Uh, some of the comments that I make have been um, congealed so that I could uh, respond to the time requirements so I get to it. Uh, the complexity of life, especially the conditions associated or linked to living with and among poverty in urban, urban cities, can be overwhelming to youth and adults. These conditions are complicated and are expanded by the cycle of poverty, discrimination, and limited educational opportunity that teach African American males at a very young age lessons about learned hopelessness and learned helplessness. Some of these factors are so systemic that they go unnoticed by the policy. Dr. And Cummings, would you move the mic a little closer, please, or make sure it's on? Is this better? No, push. pushed. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Should I start over? Okay. Uh, some of these factors are so systemic that they go unnoticed by the policy and decision makers when they attempt to address surface manifestations and symptoms of these lessons. Since the outcry is most often triggered in an event or an action that is either unconscionable or unexpected, the tendency to create a fast solution often overshadows the need to attack the root causes with a more viable longer term policy practice or solution. Uh, from the perspective of the author, uh, developed through experience, education, and research, the Committee on Government Reform through the Commission on Black Men and Boys must develop effective programs or strategies that accommodate four critical factors. These factors, along with brief descriptors, are shown in uh, the attachment, figure one, entitled Success Factors. And they are as follows. The first factor is preparation. In order for African American men and boys to lead productive and wholesome lives, they must be the beneficiaries of an educational system that features quality teaching, effective schools, and meaningful community support, all of which are in short supply currently. These ingredients should provide the content for the development of self-knowledge, cognitive, affective, and psychomotor skills, as well as spirituality. In part with these types of knowledge and skills, the African American men and boys are prepared in the processes that guarantee excellence, equity, and legitimacy. Thus, they can realize the transcendent nature of preparation as described by Orson Sweat and Mar Martin's quote, the golden opportunity you are seeking is in yourself. It is not in your environment. It is not in luck or chance or the help of others. It is in yourself alone. Second factor is opportunity. In order for African American men and boys to take advantage of the options that are available in educational institutions and the workplace, they must be guaranteed access and supplied with quality academic as well as cultural experiences. Educational and work environments must be adaptable to the strengths of a diverse population and demonstrate through positive attitudes and behaviors that the welcome is genuine and the environment is supportive. Uh, Norman Vincent Peale's words are instructive for this factor. Any fact facing us is not as important as our attitude toward it, for that determines our success or failure. The third factor is preparation. I'm, I'm sorry, the third factor is participation. In all matters, socially, educationally, politically, and economically, African American men and boys, through policy and practice, must be empowered to be actively involved as valued participants. It is useful to remember the words of Henry Ford at this juncture. Coming together is a beginning. Keeping together is progress. Working together is success. The final factor is growth and development. African American men and boys must be engaged continuously so that individual and collective mastery of education and cultural as well as societal competencies are expected and achieved. Uh, Napoleon Hill's quote seems prophetic for this factor. Strength and growth come only through continuous effort and struggle. It is a contention uh, of me that these brief descriptions of the four critical factors and the achievement thereof would prove to be the necessary ingredients for an appropriate 
and legitimate response to the effective and successful academic and workforce education of African American males and boys. A useful example of a promising intervention is the Communities and Schools Houston Incorporated Partnership. Through an array of services and quality providers focus on client needs that connect to the four critical factors, a sampling of the results for 2002-2003 is included. And I worked on the evaluation plan for this model. Essentially, um, and I'll just uh, excerpt a few things here, uh, about 3,194 African American students were served by this program. Uh, they had um, assessed on the case outcomes, uh, they had assessments for 3,988 that showed that their academic uh, behavior and their academic performance improved, their school social behavior improved 67.62%. And their attendance rate improved 51.02 percent. Uh, 7,077 students in this program stayed in school, which was 97.12 percent of the total population. 82.10 of those who stayed in school were promoted, and 17.9 percent were retained. A very few of them dropped out. Eligible to graduate from this program in the first year were 415, 400 graduated, 96.39 percent. Those who uh, aspired to post-secondary educational plans were uh, 104 planned to apply, 27 were admitted, and 107 uh, applied for admission and were admitted. This is but one example of effective programming. Uh, that has some useful elements for addressing the systemic barriers that prevent some African-American males and boys from becoming or continuing to be productive, prosperous, and proud citizens. However, one must be careful not to lose the uniqueness of individual African-American men and boys when focusing on the collective population. Thus, this testimony encourages the use of flexible policies, practices, and solutions that can be customized according to the specific needs of the individual African-American males. Uh, as an example, just on yesterday, I visited one of these programs uh, in Detroit. Uh, Cass Tech High School is uh, lifted up as a possibility for further uh, exploration in terms of combining workforce and academic education at a very high level and opening up opportunities to African-American males uh, through uh, strong partnerships with the surrounding community. I spoke with a, a representative from Ford Motor Company uh, regarding a the program they had with the school yesterday. I've also noticed these strong partnerships uh, in Houston at the multiple, at the Middle College for Technology Careers High School, where they have a very strong partnership with the um, uh, community that deals with telecommunications and information technology throughout the, the city of Houston. And they just so happen to be uh, located on the campus of Texas Southern University. And then in Dallas, I've looked at uh, Lincoln High School, which is a, a magnet school that has a strong connection to the humanities community. And they have been able to, through this partnership, provide the kind of environments that I speak about in these factors that allow limited number, and I underscore limited number, of African American men to gain some of these factors that I have uh, isolated in this presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Guatney, you're cleanup speaker here. Thank you for bearing with us. Thank you. Is this, am I on? Good morning, Chairman Davis and Congresswoman Norton. I appreciate the opportunity to participate in this hearing today. I'm Robin Guathney. I'm a project manager from the John J. Helder Center for Workforce Development, which is located at the Edward J. Blaustein School of Pl uh, Public Planning and Public Policy at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. The Helder Center is a nonprofit, nonpartisan research and policy organization um, focused on innovative um, uh, work to strengthen the workforce development system. My testimony today will focus on characteristics of effective one-stop systems and, uh, or excuse me, centers and service designs for youth. As you know, the Workforce um, Investment Act of 1998 transformed the workforce development system to a customer-focused um, 
system that provides job seekers with uh, centralized services delivered through one-stop career centers. Uh, WIA is supposed to be a ma major step toward a workforce development system that merges numerous agencies, nonprofits, government, and business education and training programs into an efficient and effective system that is capable of providing high quality career development and employment assistance. During the Act's first full year of implementation, the Heldrich Center was asked by the USDOL, ETA, to U.S. Department of Labor, Employment and Training Administration to seek out the one-stop centers operating under WIA, um, seek out those that were performing well or, or practicing, um, maintaining innovative practices and promising practices, document their success stories and share that information within the workforce development system. Um, we also participated with the Jobs for the Future uh, initiative similar to the One Stop Career Center um, design but focused on youth councils and youth service designs. With the One Stop um, Innovative, uh, One Stop Innovations um, initiative, we visited 25 sites across the country and we gathered information to share that information with the workforce development community. And there were several um, themes or major characteristics that surfaced um, that each or most of these um, centers maintain. Service integration was um, key. Those centers that were able to um, integrate services seamlessly um, provide a one point of entry contact so that the customer or client walking in um, was indifferent to who was providing service, services uh, to them were successful. Uh, and, uh, an example of that is Detroit's Workplace where they offer a host of services besides the core services required by um, the mandate. They offer services that include residential services, um, they have a parenting center on site, they have um, services for child and um, um, uh, adult um, development. The, uh, another uh, characteristic of a successful one-stop, uh, folk placed emphasis on serving a universal job seeker employer population which drove a re-engineering of the entire um, approach to providing workforce services. Several areas developed tools or providing uh, cutting edge information and tools to clients. Uh, an example of this can be found in, uh, by the greater, by the Golden Crescent Workforce Development Board which is located in Victoria, Texas. And they have a uh, concierge-like set up where folks are, when clients come in, they are provided uh, hands-on assistance throughout the system and pretty much um, all their problems and issues can be addressed um, at the center. In Baltimore, we found Baltimore to be, Baltimore Youth Council actually, to be uh, an example, a great example of how leadership and collaboration um, work to the benefit of or the intent uh, to which it was designed. In Baltimore, they have the commitment of the mayor and the local CBOs, community-based organizations, and other uh, major youth development organizations to design and provide a, um, a youth service design that uh, has merit or, or provides impact to the youth that it serves. One of the characteristics or um, notable characteristics that the Youth Council employs is that to be a part of the Youth Council, you can't miss more than two meetings, and if you do, um, you're asked to vacate your seat. But also those folks participating or agreeing to participate on the Youth Council uh, bring all of the resources that their respective organizations hold to the table to share with the other folks um, that are participating in the Youth Council or the Youth Council system. 
So in closing, I uh, would say that the, uh, there is no one model of success for workforce development, uh, for one-stop centers or youth service designs, that there is a uh, myriad of, of, of various um, um, models or designs out there and that the research that we, our research supports that WIA is a locally driven program and that the vision, the, the, the vision of change um, is impacted by the politics and the local culture and heritage and bureaucracy um, significant to the, uh, the locale. So that being said, um, I thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you added an important perspective here as well. Um, before we start the questions, uh, Ms. Norton, uh, we want to recognize some uh, visitors we have here with us. Thank you very, very kindly, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I note that another of the commissioners has come in, Mr. Raheem Jen Jenkins, a very active member of the commission, Pete Stan. Thank Appreciate you very much being. for being with us. Uh, and, and we have some visitors who come at a time when, in a real sense, we're talking about them, although I'm sure they're simply here as part of my D.C. Students in the Capital Program where I try to get uh, every young person in the District of Columbia before they graduate from high school to come to the Capitol. Uh, so I'd like to welcome uh, students from the Elsie Whitlow Stokes Community Freedom Public Charter School. This is a school which has 222 students, 220 students from kindergarten through fifth grade, and now they're about to incorporate the sixth grade. And if I could just read, in light of what uh, we are discussing here today, uh, one part of what their brochure says, and it's called Our Parents. Um, Parents who choose the Elsie Whitlow Stokes Community Freedom Charter School for their children commit to active involvement in their children's education and to helping fulfill the mission of the school. I want to thank this, uh, the, the Stokes uh, Freedom Public Charter School uh, for your work in our city and particularly for that ingredient of your program. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Norton, thank you. And you know, Ms. Norton, I had a knockdown drag out earlier this week on the uh, voucher system for the city, but whether it's public schools, vouchers, whatever, uh, nothing replaces uh, parental involvement in kids' education. I think I hear that coming from everybody here today, that it, it starts at home if you can do it. Unfortunately, in some cases, uh, we don't have that opportunity. Uh, I was one of the lucky ones. Uh, I, my uh, father was in and out of my life, but I had a very strong mother, and uh, she knew that education was critical. And uh, you know, uh, ran the whip over me to make sure that I studied hard and that I could be anything I wanted to do. And uh, so uh, I, was, I was very fortunate. We have a lot of single parent families that are succeeding and we have some with foster parents who are succeeding because they're instilling hope in their kids, but we have so many others that aren't. Uh, and of course, even if you have two strong parents, no nothing in this world uh, assures anything. I know some of the best parents whose kids have gone astray, it's, it's, it's tough. but. I can imagine being an African American in a in a uh, urban area, uh, where employment prospects are bleak, uh, where hope doesn't seem to reign. How difficult that is. Hardest thing for me, and and Ms. Norton and I have had a lot of discussions about this. Is as a as a white guy from the suburbs, uh, one of the, I represent the wealthiest district in the country, but we're just outside of Washington. We're literally 10 miles away from some of the people here that uh, we don't think that don't have the same opportunities. How do we bridge that gap? Our unemployment rate in Fairfax is under 3 percent. Uh, not to say we don't have some economic problems. Uh, we have tons of immigrants moving in, taking jobs, moving up. But just right across the river, uh, our kids who uh, come, out, uh, come out of the womb are, are have the same opportunities. Uh, in many cases, the same. they have the same talents that we have, but they just never develop. Uh, we saw this with Lorton Prison, which, uh, working with Mrs. Norton, we were able to close because, not because it was in Virginia and our, my constituents didn't like it, but because they weren't getting job training and education there, and they were coming out worse than where they started. And we put them in a federal system now where they can, in many cases, get an education, get their GED, uh, learn a trade, and come out and uh, start their lives again. They dig a little hole for themselves when they go in there, but they can climb out of it with uh, uh, appropriate training. Uh, again, Mrs. Norton and I work together on this D.C. Uh, scholarship bill that allows D.C. students to pay in-state tuition at Virginia and Maryland universities. Again, giving some kind of hope that college is at least affordable for them. 
uh, or more affordable than it, than it was before. But public policy is complex. So we don't always know what works, and that's why we had our knockdown on, on vouchers and some other issues, how we go this. Uh, we kind of want the same things, but each of your testimony today uh, touched me and it gives me a little bit different perspective because uh, you're dealing with kids in an environment that a lot of members don't see every day, and therefore we don't have to pay attention to it as part of our political constituencies. And yet it's right here in the nation's capital and it's around the country. And it's our future, and we can't have a society that one side is growing and prospering and the other uh, is, is just, uh, it, uh, it seems to have no prospects at all. Uh, let me say to the kids from the charter school here, we have a very distinguished panel here talking about the, uh, currently uh, the, the situation for black men and boys in, in the District of Columbia and, and around the country. Two are former Redskins here, uh, George Stark and Charles Mann are here, and uh, some other are very learned professors who are the tops in their field uh, around the country, and we're all looking uh, for answers. Well, I've got, a, I've got a, just a few questions before I hand over to, to Mrs. Norton. Um, the, uh, let me start with Charles Mann. Charles, you talked about the role that Jesus Christ and religion has played in your life and in other lives, and uh, mm -hmm. a lot of athletes, uh, you, you see it when they score a touchdown, or it's just, it's a major part of motivating them uh, talk about the role of the church and how that's, uh, in some ways, uh, that, that can help. In some ways, it's fading in, in urban areas as well. And if you give us just a little perspective on that. Well, I think, first of all, um, you know, uh, most black families are rooted in spirituality. And they, um, because of slave days, and that was the only hope we had, our, our, our mothers, a lot of times, were rooted and grounded um, let me just sidebar here for a second. I have a brother who I have, I, I'm from a family of seven. Uh, I'm the second to the youngest. I have a brother who is incarcerated right here in Virginia. Um, he moved from California, that's where I'm originally from, and uh, fell on hard times and, and went right into the system. His son is also in the system in California. So this touches me very close. Um, so I know, um, yet we had both a mother and a father raise us. My father did die of cancer at 46 years old. I was 20 years old at the time when he passed. But, uh, you know, so I, everything we're talking about today really touches me, and it, it hits right at home. And my, my brother, who is incarcerated, uh, just moved to a medium security prison in somewhere in Richmond area, has found his way, and, and prison, uh, if I could say this, has been a good thing for him. If he would have been outside, he would be dead. Um, but now he has found his way, and he has found it because of strategically sending men in there to speak into his life, and then we had his undivided attention for the first time. And he has found his way because he now loves the Lord. And it... Those, those athletes that you see giving it up to the Lord and, you know, kneeling and saying a quick prayer, just because you say you follow the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't mean if you're an apple tree, there's got to be apples on the tree. You've got to produce fruit. And a lot of people, it's cool right now to say you're a Christian. It's cool to get on your knee and, and, and give it up for the Lord when you score a touchdown. Those men aren't necessarily believing and, 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 and following the same God that I am. What we need to do and how we do it, um, how I've been uh, trained, is you first, once you've made a commitment to the Lord, then you get under somebody. Uh, you, Paul had a, had a Timothy in the Bible, and he trained that young man, and he developed him. So you need discipleship. And that's what the Good Samaritan Foundation is doing with our, with our children is we're discipling them. We're growing them up in the truth and the knowledge of who Jesus Christ is and what he means in their lives and how to live out this life, a life where the world says you should do it one way. And we're saying, no, the Bible says this is the way. And so it's contrary. Let me just give a scripture and then I'll be quiet. Um, uh, scripture, one of the first scriptures I learned when I came to knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ was found in Romans 12, 1 and 2. 
And the King James Version says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And be not conformed to this world. Don't be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. The world has it saying it one way, and the Lord is saying it totally different. A lot of times we need to find our way, and if we can find an older gentleman to bring us up, and then as we get brought up, we can find a younger kid for us to bring up, mm -hmm. then we've got something going. And I've got people speaking into my life, and I'm speaking into other men's lives, young men, that I'm trying to train. And I, that, to me, is so much more important than all this other stuff. You know, government um, has a role, but there are some things the government can't do, and, and that's the. Uh, uh, and I they can provide that. opportunities. Absolutely. They can provide opportunities. And Joe Gibbs, let, let me, uh, Joe Gibbs was great at this. A lot of people don't know Joe Gibbs loved the Lord, and he allowed oh. men to show share their faith, and he encouraged it. And a lot of times, he got in trouble for keeping Christians on the team longer than he should have. Right. <laughs> I probably got an extra year or two, <laughs> um, but because he knew it wasn't about having the greatest athlete on the team. It wasn't the guy who had all the talent. It was men of integrity coming together. In 1991, this Super Bowl ring that I'm wearing, we didn't have the greatest team, but we had a bunch of guys that played together. It was not about them, it was about the team. That didn't come because we were great athletes. It came because he had a bunch of core men that loved the Lord, that found a way to, to work in a community. Thank you. Ms. Guapney, let me uh, ask you, you made an interesting observation, and that is that the successful programs you've observed are really locally driven. And one of the things we wrestle with here is, uh, you know, if compassion and dollars could solve our problems, we would have solved them a long time ago. And public policy is, you know, what works one place may not work somebody, somewhere else. And a lot of it does depend on leadership, uh, cooperation, uh, a lot of things, teamwork. And you don't get it everywhere. And the program, these, these very broad programs that we put out that mean well sometimes, uh, they lose it as they move uh, down and get administered in different areas. Uh, that's not to say that we shouldn't be using federal resources. It's just the question, how do we use them the best way? Do we, to get it down to the community where it can be used and coordinated, evaluated? The federal system is one where we learn uh, by uh, these laboratories of democracy out there in cities and states where they build successful programs. And, the successful programs I've seen are ones that target a school or a community or a family, an individual, as opposed to the broad brush approach, which just doesn't seem to reach uh, uh, the same way. But am, am I, is, is that, do you see it the same way or do you have a little bit different uh, view on that? Well, our, you know, our research, as while we're out and about, pretty much the leadership is key. It, it, there has to be a vision and a willingness of folks to come to the table and, and as the folks in Baltimore say, put your eagles at the door. And that um, with, r regardless of the program that you represent or your funding stream that you're willing to put or pool your resources um, to achieve, to achieve the, the same goal. And so where there has been success um, in that instance, folks have done that. They've been able to, to put aside um, politics, if you will, or, or the need to be right or first and, and, and recognize that there's an opportunity here for us to do something great to have impact and then go about the business of figuring out how to do that so that it's a it's a win-win game for everyone as opposed to someone uh, gaining more benefit or, or more uh, notoriety than the yeah. other. Um, Dr. Wilson, I, uh, one thing I've got out of your testimony was, and I think it's very insightful, and that is the, the decreased demand for low-skilled labor. Uh, if you don't have an education or a skill set uh, with the way the global economy is going today, you're pretty much out of luck. Um, and that puts education and job training at a premium uh, more than anything else. I, what, from your perspective, um, what, what programs work? What could we be doing more here uh, that, that we're not doing now? I mean, toward that end. One thing I think is 
That's very, very important, and I would consider it you might think of it as a short-term solution, but it might have long-term consequences, positive consequences. And that is trying to improve the school-to-work transition. I mean, that is a terrible problem. Uh, in my uh, larger paper, I talked about the fact that a lot of black kids in the inner city graduate from high school in June, and by October, you know, a small percentage, a fraction of them actually have jobs. Uh, uh, and that's related to the problem of school to work transition. And I think that we should really focus on creating apprenticeship programs and internships for these young people in cities like Washington, D.C. Uh, that would uh, facilitate and ease their transition into the employment. Okay. I, I, and, and the problem now we see is jobs moving out of the city, uh, plentiful sometimes in suburban areas or so-called edge cities. Uh, we tend to lose our way then and we get caught up in egos and not coordination between jurisdictions. And there's, I think there's a tremendous opportunity for our jurisdictions to work closer on, on these kind of issues too uh, uh, for opportunities on that. Uh, Mr. Stark, let me ask you a question. Uh, uh, role models are just critical is what you've, uh, you know, in, in your experience. Can, can you talk a little bit more about that? I think um, the role model, if it's not in the home, um, you're looking on the street, uh, you can look to the media and that. Can, what can we do to, to, to find better role models and reach out and get you? I know you've been working on this for some time, but uh, it's, you, you can't do it on a large scale. You have to almost do it a, a little at a time. Can you talk about that? Well, Charles mentioned it himself. The, uh, there are organizations, you know, the, the, the commission, one of the, the, uh, the, uh, the obligations of the Commission on Black Men and Boys was, was to identify and sort of coordinate other programs and, and sort of under, under one umbrella. You know, you, know, you know what I do. I do education, technical stuff. Uh, it turns out that, that when you look seriously and closely to the, to the neighborhoods, there, there are groups like Charles's, and there, there are mentorship groups all over the city. Um, and so I think that the people are there. I, I think the emotion is there. I, I don't think the government can have a whole lot of impact on this. I'm not sure that money would help this whatsoever, maybe somewhere. It, it's mostly a community thing where the, the, the groups and the caring, like I said, I, I believe they're there. We've, we've run across a lot of them as part of our, our, part of our research as the commission. And so uh, part of what we're trying to do is coordinate them and, and hook up these guys. With, I mean, you have got people on one hand who want to help who are individuals that might be retired, and they're not sure where they should go to offer their services. And so a lot of it's coordination. Uh, but you're right, Tom. I mean, I mean on, on one level, it's the, the mentoring and, and the one-on-one -on -one stuff. Uh, happens at a, on a community level, but small groups or individuals, and that seems to be there. You know, it's it's how you take that love really, and uh, and put it with education and technical training and school to work and all that other stuff. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I just say to, to uh, Charles Mann, my father did serve a couple tours in the uh, prison system in Virginia, so I've had some acquaintance with that. Uh, you know, well, but I had a very strong mother. I mean, that just makes all the difference in the world. It just keeps you straight. In some ways, I think my father, a wonderful man, but was a negative role model in terms of what you didn't become and what you could if you didn't uh, uh, watch things. But I appreciate your testimony and your story. I think all this is very helpful to us. So thank you. Ms. Norton? Well, first, first let me comment on, on the um, quality of the testimony. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's been extraordinary testimony. Each and every one of you have provided me with insights or information uh, uh, that I certainly did not have before, and I want to begin by just thanking you for that. Um, I, I'd like to perhaps ask a question. I don't know, it may, the first question may involve uh, Mr. Stark, Mr. Mann, and uh, Dr. Wilson, because in, in essence, it, it seems clear that this is so complicated that one has to put together a set of ingredients in order to begin to grapple with the complicated issues that are before us. Um, uh, Dr. Wilson is a world-class researcher. His work in the field 
and his theoretical world work is is uh, uh, unique in how how uh, he has uncovered uh, these issues, issues involving black people, but especially black men, his field work in Chicago uh, and his writings have been uh, the best work in the field. And we are so pleased that you were able to be here. But you will notice that uh, Dr. Wilson did not confine his, his testimony entirely to uh, jobs, although that is, and uh, that is, and I agree with him, central to everything. A man without money and without a job will find money. Having money to do whatever you want to do is associated with manhood in the world and not just in our country. So if you don't find it through the legitimate economy, we now know you will find it. And we just got to face that. I appreciate what um, uh, Mr. Mann said about faith, but he also told the truth <laughs> that the, these youngsters come from homes with strong faith traditions. That's been the tradition of our community even during slavery, <laughs> when they embraced the faith of slave masters who believed they were unequal. Oh, we are faith-based people. And yet these same children coming from homes where they hear Jesus spoken to every day are in the street, you know, shooting people. So you, uh, I, 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 I appreciate what you say about athletes getting on their knees. And of course, we read in the paper about some of them engaging in sexual abuse or even taking guns uh, going in the street as if they didn't have millions of dollars in the first place. This is very, very complicated. And it does go to opportunity, but it also goes to cultural matters. Ms. Uh, Dr. Wilson talked about apprenticeship, school to work. This is, this is an example on Dr. Cummings' work. These are examples of short-term things that can matter. I'm on another committee uh, that has to do with federal construction and renovation in the District of Columbia. That's, that's the granddaddy of contractors. And I've been able to get the GSA to agree that there will be a certified apprenticeship program whenever you build anything or renovate anything in the District of Columbia. And what that means, uh, for example, is that if you build the Woodrow Wilson Bridge, you have to have a certified apprenticeship program so that the next time there's a construction job, you have been certified as to how much you can do. These are examples of the kind of decent paying jobs that black men uh, used to be able to get, at least when we began to integrate the crafts that uh, have not been available because for, for uh, 25 years now there's not been uh, the kind of federally supported apprenticeship uh, programs. Uh, uh, I want to ask uh, 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 initially uh, Mr. Stark, Mr. Mann, and Dr. Wilson um, about how to penetrate so that we can get toward uh, the point where jobs legitimate jobs are what the average young black man believes he can get and should seek. Uh, and before we get to schools um, and, and, and the, the, the absence of education, which accounts for so much of this, <coughs> Dr. Wilson testified to something that the Commission on Black Men and Boys and certainly the people at this table, we begin with Dr. Stark and Mr. Mr. Mann have seen firsthand. And he talked about a kind of vicious cycle of attitudes, where you bring these harsh attitudes out of your condition in the ghetto. And then, of course, in the workplace, they turn people off so they know they want you there, which then turns you off more. Uh, and, and you become further estranged from the possibility of work. Now, I, I, I want to ask whether, uh, Mr. Stark and his program, Mr. Mann and his program have found youngsters coming with these attitudes and how you break through them. And I want to ask uh, uh, Dr. Wilson if he believes that um, those attitudes are, 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 are capable of being met through programs, whether we have to go to, to the churches. But if this is the predicate, the very attitude you bring to, to, to a job, which is what you need to live, 
Uh, and that attitude almost disqualifies you for moving forward into legitimate work. My first question is a very hard one, I recognize. But whether you've had any experience dealing with that problem, with overcoming that problem, and whether you think there's any role for any sector to play, that would, uh, I suppose, go to all of you, including Dr. Wilson, in dealing with that threshold concern. Okay. Uh, let me go first, that, if you don't mind. The, um, the attitude problem. Of course, we, uh, like you said, it's, it's a, it's, it, nothing is ever simple, but I think that a lot of that attitude which turns off the employer is really fear, you know, fear of rejection. And so people build their own failure in. And we see it all the time. And that's, and over, you know, you, you, know, you have, a, we have graduates who, who can, who can do it, who are technically capable of getting a good job in the automobile business field. And they'll go out and they'll dress like an idiot. And you bring him back and say, what are you doing? Now you know you can't go into the guy doesn't know you from Adam. You've graduated from school, you've taken all your tests, you've studied like heck, you, and then you dress like a fool and you get rejected. <laughs> that's just a person that's, a, you know, he's built his failure into that, right? Because he's never been successful before. He, and he doesn't realize that he has the tools to do it, you know. Uh, you know, that's like the years ago, you know, people didn't want to act white and go to school. And that was once again, I mean, how silly was that? That's building your failure in because you're, you're just afraid. Uh, you know, you're, you're afraid because you don't know anybody who's been successful and, you, and your own self-esteem is such that you don't want to be rejected again, so you build failure in. Um, simply enough, we overcome that. Just You have to work with, with, for us. That's just, that's a counseling issue, and, and we get that done. But you do, you have found that, you have found <coughs> young people entering with that and you've been able to deal with that fear? Yes. Uh -huh. we, we, do, we see that every day. Yeah, but you can deal with that. For I us. I suppose, if I may say so, learning how to do something that few of us know how to do, fix automobiles, may, 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 may chase a lot of fear from you. Well, you it, it you should. You, you, you would think on one level it would, and for most people it does, but it really, you know, back in the back of your mind, though, if you've never had, you know, we, we had a graduation uh, quickly uh, a couple of months ago, and, and it was something I probably wouldn't have done. And my principal said to me, he said, look, George, a lot of these people who are graduating from your school have never completed anything in their whole life before. They've started and dropped out. They've started and dropped out. And they don't fundamentally believe that they can be successful. And so you, you, you give them things along the way to say, look, you, you can do this. Um, and, and, and we, we get through it. But so the logic doesn't, you know, it's it, it disconnected for me. I'm thinking a guy or gal who's, who spent so much time in school who's graduated would automatically feel, you know, at, at equal with other people in the workforce. But that's not necessarily true. I mean, that's just a counseling issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. for, for our program, we, we take kids 14 years and, uh, to 18. So we get a child comes in as a freshman in high school. They've already... Uh, been told they can't succeed. They've already, we get them at a tough age. But the first thing we start doing with them and the way we win them over and they come in with those attitudes is we love on them. And we love on them a lot. We, we, we do a lot of fun things. People in the community uh, will send us, you know, tickets to the Orioles games. We'll take them here. We'll take them there. We love on them. We really act as, as, as parents, if you will, uh, foster parents to these kids. And initially, they're hard. They have hard exteriors, especially the men and the boys. Uh, but we love on them. I brought a group of the, the, the seniors to my home. We, they went swimming. And they hung out. You know, we barbecued and everything. I mean, the, these kids are like, you know, you are... You know, you're an untouchable. You're, you, you, we saw you on TV. You did all these great things. And I'm up in your space and in your house and with your three children and, and with your wife. And, and so we welcome them into our home. We love on them like you wouldn't believe. And love, will it really works. It really does. It's not fake. It's not phony. It's it, no cameras. Nobody's seeing us doing this stuff. But it's important. And so we love on these kids like they hadn't been loved on before. We tell them they're special. And then we show it in our actions. And then all those exteriors start breaking down. And then we got them. 
And once we got them, we, we just graduated. We had 22 kids in our program that were seniors this year. 16 of them uh, graduated and went on to four-year institutions. We had the valedictorian of Anacostia High School in our program. He turned down a four-year scholarship to GW, the first time George Washington University has ever given a scholarship offer to a kid at Anacostia. And Anacostia used to be all white years ago. First time ever, this kid got it. He turned it down because he went to Stanford. That's what we're producing in our, in our program because we're loving on these kids. Uh, Dr. Wilson, as you answer this, I, I, I remind you that you, you, know, you are such a truth teller. You even said in your testimony that black men are having difficulty getting even menial jobs. Yes, uh, because the menial jobs that are available uh, tend to be in the service sector and are competing with a growing number of, of immigrants and women who have been at the labor market. And employers have the perception that these uh, other workers, the, employ the immigrants and women, are more acceptable than, than the black men. Uh, and let me say that this attitude toward black men, I think, sort of grew out of the response, uh, the way in which black men have responded to declining employment opportunities over time. And as they become experience greater joblessness, you know, they return to other means to survive, crime, drugs, these kinds of things, which reinforces that image. And let me just say something, you know, I think the attitude problem is important, uh, but, but it has to be put in, put in proper context. Uh, if the attitude issue was so overwhelming, black men would not respond to expanding opportunities. And let's just take the late 1990s and into year 2000. The economic boom had an incredible positive effect on black men. Not only black men, but all uh, low-skilled uh, uh, workers. I'm talking about low-skilled workers now. Uh, black men were working more, and this is based on systematic research. In the late 1990s, they were working more, black men ages 16, to 34, were working more, earning higher wages, and committing far fewer crimes than in the early 1990s. And you're talking, what we're talking about now are not educated black men, we're talking about black men with a high school education or less, many of them with prison records. They were finding jobs because employers were looking for workers instead of workers looking for employers. Some employers actually were so hard pressed that they were no longer using the drug tests because they needed workers, you see. So black men do respond to expanding opportunities. And if we could have continued that economic boom period for several decades, the boom period of the late 1990s, you would have seen some remarkable changes in a lot of these uh, inner city neighborhoods uh, that we're uh, concerned about. Having said that, however, uh, it's unlikely that we're going to come back to that boom period in the near future. And so the question is, are there programs, you know, that would deal with some of these attitude problems that grow out of disappointment and uh, uh, that would deal with these attitude problems effectively. Yes, there have been, there are such programs, and they have also been researched very carefully like, by organizations like the Manpower Demonstration Research Corporation, MDRC. And I'm talking about programs like Progress, Project Quest in San Antonio and Strive. Uh, these, the, 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 these programs uh, provide skill training, hard skills, soft skills, and soft skills you're dealing with this attitudinal problem and the way in which these young people present themselves. These programs have proven to be uh, effective. But let me just say this. These programs deal with what we call supply side matters, not the demand side. Demand side is when you create a demand for employment. Supply side is when you provide the education and training for these uh, people. Supplied side programs are not very effective, or I shouldn't re rephrase, rephrase that. It's more difficult to have effective su supply side programs in a dismal economy. 
You know, people say, well, why am I going through this when there are no jobs available? So I just, I just want to underline that, that point. But Congressman Norton, can I, Congresswoman Norton, may I just make one other point that's unrelated to this, but it goes back to an earlier point that uh, our Chairman Wax, uh, Davis, uh, that uh, someone made. And that is um, parents, uh, effective, parent, effective parenting, and the outcomes of children. And when I think about this, the question for me is not why some kids make it in these troubled neighborhoods, but why so many kids do not make it, even when they have effective parents. It is much easier to be a parent in the suburbs than in the inner city, where you have conditions that undermine, not reinforce parenting. I'd like to take some of those parents in the suburbs and put them in the inner city and see how effective they will be over the long term. And uh, I think it's important, it's important to, to, to recognize that. There are very effective parents in the inner city, and some of them are doing a marvelous job. But the, challenging, or, uh, the challenges they face are overwhelming, and some of them don't succeed, even though they, they are dedicated and committed to their children. So I think I, I just wanted to underscore that point. Oh, goodness. I very much thank you for that point, because, because this, this notion of parents competing with the streets particularly if it's a boy child, uh, difficult for parents to compete with the culture on television, all of the, the things that you're supposed to do in order to be one of the, uh, one of, one of the, the guys. But uh, it has always uh, seemed to me to be uh, beyond comprehension, particularly how a single mother living in a part of the city surrounded by thugs and drugs and guns somehow keeps hold of that child. Uh, um, and uh, the point you make there about even having two parents uh, in that and, and dealing in that competition is one of the great challenges facing our country. Increasingly, um, uh, middle class parents see it in their own way uh, as well. Appreciate that. Uh, I, I think I should move on to Mr. Quanda because we've been talking about how attitudes and difficulties uh, compound. Uh, Congresswoman, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, I need to excuse myself. We did understand yeah. that you would have yeah. to le leave yeah. early, and we, we want to thank you for much. your testimony. Thank you very Charles, much. Charles, thank yeah. you very much. Uh, we, we got a request from staff to you sign a couple of footballs for you guys. <laughs> so no problem. No way out the door. We're no gonna, problem. We're going to Thank you very you. much for the time, and uh, I really appreciate it. Well, we getting appreciate your testimony. Oh, and I, you know, thank and you. I, we'll, be, we'll just be, I think, a few more minutes. But yeah, you'll you have to forgive us for the quid pro quo that the chairman here exacts from witnesses. Uh, Mr. Quandy, we're moving on to the figure that I opened with, which is that uh, not half of all black men are in prison, but half of those in prison are black men. This is a completely incomprehensible and unbearable figure. But it means that in every community, you're going to get back from prison large numbers of uh, black men. Now, the attitudes that people have who've never been to prison uh, that, that have been under discussion are well known. Uh, I'd like some discussion with you about your own work because you need you you of course have to deal with those attitudes uh, right up front. You um, are dealing in an economy that even that Dr. Wilson is right. I mean, I saw during the late 1990s inmates from Lorton get work, and I was amazed at it. But look at this economy. So I want to ask you about uh, your program. Just what, and it's just very important for people to know. Our inmates uh, are in a federal program, and for there are some difficulties there. But in many ways, it is many steps ahead for inmates from the District of Columbia because there is no state system that does anything <laughs> with inmates. But the federal system does provide services, uh, 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 anger management, 
um, drug and alcohol rehabilitation uh, and job finding services, halfway houses, the kinds of services that inmates in the United States seldom get. So it, it, it would seem logical to ask you, who've had to deal with the, the hardest of those attitudes, in a service-oriented environment, what has been your success uh, when there was a boom economy, and what has been your success more recently during this downturn in the economy? So if you could address those, all of those questions, I'd appreciate it. Certainly. Economics is, is the key. As you indicated earlier, a man needs to have money in his pocket. A man needs to provide for his family and for himself. And there are many options. He can do it legitimately or he's going to go out in the streets and do it illegally and get back into this criminal justice system. What we try to do is to break down that attitude and to try to develop in the returning offender some sense of empathy for his community and for himself. He has to care about what it is that he's doing and about his community. All too often, when an individual is sentenced, when he's looking at that, that judge who's going to determine his fate, he often mentions his children, that he doesn't want to be separated from his children. When he comes back to us, we like to remind him of that. Children and your family are key to your existence and they're key to our community. One of the things that we have done, uh, Congresswoman Norton, is to work with existing resources and programs that are already in place. The faith community in the District of Columbia is, is strong and is remarkable. Many faith institutions have ongoing programs, church ministries for uh, prisoners, clothing, um, food, things of that nature. What we have developed is a program um, where we have 150, I believe, um, faith institutions who have signed on that run the gamut from the Nation of Islam, the Church of Scientology, to the Archdiocese of Washington, D.C., who have all come in to join in a mentoring program so that when that offender comes in, it's not only the CSO, the Community Supervision Officer, the Parole or Probation Officer, that is talking to him about that attitude, but a, a mentor, someone that that person may relate to. The other thing that we've tried to do is to try to, to match up other programs. Uh, Mr. Stark's program is a, is a prime example. Uh, Mr. Stark spoke at a, um, a forum that was um, held at GW um, University earlier this year, and he talked about his program. And for a good government bureaucrat, he said those magic words, free. So <laughs> I approached them, and in June, we enrolled a number of our offenders into his, his project. Not only did we enroll them, but we matched mentors with those offenders so that they could have that support network. Because all too often, when an offender is back home, it, it's not a, a safe environment. As soon as he walks out of that door, he's seeing drugs, he's seeing crime, he's seeing prostitution, he's seeing all those things that pull him back into the criminal justice system. And what we try to do with the mentorship program, and we're just beginning it and we're growing it, we're trying to get it larger, is to provide that offender with not only a professional in the role of a CSO, but someone who's out there in that community who can give support and guidance. Many of our offenders, as they were growing up, have never seen a mother or a father get up because of an alarm clock that says it's time to get up, we got to go to work. They just don't see it. And so when you talk about developing skills and you talk about soft skills, how do you deal with someone at the job place who is your supervisor who you're not getting along with? Do you just turn away and walk away? Or do you learn how to deal with it? One of the other problems that we face with people that have been incarcerated coming back in is that there's just a, a high degree of frustration very quickly. And we have to work with them and with others so that we can sort of remedy that level of frustration to keep them in the process so that we can develop those skills, get them through those critical periods, and get them back up on their feet. Now, the second part of my question, you, you, there were some really extraordinary statistics that came forward from your program. This was before you came there, but it was during the good economy, mm -hmm. where uh, during hearings before this committee, 
uh, your program precisely because of the services or, or, and, and the mentor services are fine, but you were offering hardcore services, the, the ones I mentioned before, anger management, uh, a job, uh, job, uh, jobs finding, uh, you were, you, you, you had people in halfway houses so you could deal with them. And in other words, it was, it, it, what the federal government does is a real model for what it does for when people get out of prison. All right, that was in the very good economy. The recidivism rate was very low. It was really a wonderful set of statistics. It, it showed a government program really working because the federal government was putting the money into the services to make it possible for ex-felons uh, to, in fact, proceed in uh, regular society. Now we come to a different economy. We've had a job fair. Uh, just in July. And among those who came, and we had almost 10,000 people to come, among those who came were a fair number of recently re released people from the federal prisons. And I, I, I didn't quite know what to say to them. I didn't believe for real that given two people, one who had a record and one that did not, that my constituents who had just gotten out of prison would rationally seem to the employer the person that should be hired. That's what was in my mind. Now, what has been your experience and what do you do about the fact that there's so many coming home now when the economy is turned down, notwithstanding your services? It's a, it's a tough issue and in many cases it's a dilemma for us. What we've tried to do is to make each of our field sites, and we're located in the community. We're at seven field sites um, throughout the District of Columbia. So in many cases, we're accessible either through Metro or for a walk for our offenders. What we're trying to do is to provide those skills and those trainings that make them attractive to the employers, right in-house, right in those field sites. So what we're trying to do, and we've succeeded in certain respects, is to have the one shop stopping shopping right here in our field sites so that when they come in, if their reading is deficient, we have learning labs that are right there in the site. We're trying to get, in some field sites, we already have vocational development specialists right there on board. As far as the other services that we are providing, um, men and women in the criminal justice system, they have to be responsive to our accountability needs. So they have their substance abuse testing that's done in that site. And we're also offering some groups to deal with the substance abuse, the anger management, the family counseling, things of that nature that will help them to make that transition. It, it's an uphill battle because you're right. They have to compete with others who don't have that criminal justice background. But at the same time, they can bring to the workforce some experience of real life. They know that they've made mistakes. They know where those traps are. Sometimes they can offer an employer just what he needs. I've been down and out. I've been down that wrong road. I need an opportunity. And sometimes there are employers out there, and we are doing, I think, a much better job today in trying to educate employers to give our people an opportunity. Because if you give them an opportunity, we think we have the structure in place that we can sustain it. It is difficult, but those are some of the challenges and those are some of the things that we're trying to do um, to assist. The other area I need to speak on is the Department of Employment Services in the District of Columbia. Um, we are actually trying to get them in our location. We've signed a memorandum of understanding with them, but there have been funding issues for them. So they're really not on board. We want them in place so that our people can go right to their office, they can pick up the phone, and we can start making some of these things work. I, I, it's really extraordinary to see how you have, have created one-stop centers out of what might not have been that in, in the first place just by being responsive to your constituent community. I was very impressed with what you said about training. I mean, if you go out here and look for a job and you can't find one, and your field offices at least is providing some training, you're doing the exact equivalent of what a lot of young people are doing today. They can't find a job when they get out of, out of college or out of high school. So they say, well, I guess I'm going to go on and get some more education. So they then go to the local community college or to the state college, uh, and, and they wouldn't have done that mm -hmm. if, in fact, the, the economy was good. Let me move on to uh, Dr. Cummings, because I'm very, very interested in what you've done in the model 
that you described because the success rate was so extraordinary. Uh, and in this notion also alluded to by uh, Dr. Uh, Wilson ab about how the school's work notion, uh, not one size doesn't fit all. We tell everybody, of course, you should try to go to college, but the fact is that increasing numbers of people are finding good jobs without going to college, some of them in the techni te technical areas. Um, but uh, uh, it's somehow bridging the gap between people who find school not relevant to their lives uh, and uh, coming out and being able to find a job very much interested me in your testimony. And so I, I'd really like to, to, to know how you produce those statistics. How did you, what was it that led to those good outcomes and led to young people staying in school? Well, I, uh, Congresswoman uh, Norton, I think there were a number of factors. Um, the first thing uh, in, the, in the Houston area, I, I speak about these compacts when I'm talking to people, these partnerships that are uh, addressing what I think Dr. Wilson was talking about, both the supply side and the demand side. Um, on the supply side, uh, the communities and school piece that I spoke about, which is just one of many, uh, had the opportunity to have the full endorsement of the Greater Houston Partnership, which is the demand side to a certain extent. And so going in, they had all the resources on the table to make the program successful. Uh, but a, a bigger problem with the uh, partnership between the demand and the supply side appears to me to be the, the attitudes of the people in charge. And somebody has to, to deal with that because uh, in this workforce environment uh, where the workplace is comprised of people who have um, entitlements because of uh, the status quo, somebody has to be able to articulate a need or maybe even a demand for them to consider people who are not like them as, as people who should benefit from both the training side as well as the opportunity to utilize the training in an economic uh, uh, way that enables them to do the things that we've been talking about associated with uh, uh, living well and participating in society. The, the, the notion that I, that I tried to get at with respect to looking at some of these places was how did these schools, because I'm basically interested in the effect of schools that serve African American youngsters. Uh, that's my research agenda. That's what I do for the National Alliance of Black School Educators. And in looking at the, the ingredients, what I find is that there is a, an expectation in these schools which feature workforce training that academic and, and skill-based training have equal importance and that the programs are not programs where you throw somebody away because they're going to get into a program that leads to a job. You Back actually- Back to the old fashioned vocational yeah. school. That's, that's still there. As a matter of fact, uh, I, I some preliminary findings from the NAVE study, I think I can share those with you. I was on the independent advisory panel for that. Suggest that people who concentrate in high skills <laughs> training program actually over the course of their life earn more. They also academic courses because they're in high quality programs and it demands that you have the kind of uh, background that's necessary to be successful. You've got to have the mathematics, you've got to have the science, and so on. And also, it suggests that uh, not only do they have uh, those two ingredients, but they, they see themselves as pursuing post-secondary options, which in my mind adds to their ability to meet in a situation like the one I described in, in Houston, to meet the demands of the individuals who have the jobs available uh, and are asking for them to have certain skills and certain knowledge. It gives them the opportunity to change their ways of uh, recruiting, hiring, and promoting individuals in their, in their places of work. It's a, it's a very different and a very difficult environment in order to, uh, to get the results when you have individuals who are frowned upon just because of the nature of their uh, gender and their race and you've got individuals who are in charge who have not been sensitized to the need to do something about that that's different than what, than what got them in place. Well, your testimony is very deep, uh, Dr. Cummins. It suggests that many high schools need to be reorganized altogether, 
regardless of who is in charge, uh, that the, the, the equivalence between one kind of training and other kind of education uh, needs, to, needs to be there. And I'm afraid that's not there in most schools. And most schools are known for one kind of education. And if you happen to be in that neighborhood and go there and that education doesn't suit you, you, you you're out of luck. But if that school was reorganized so that children who needed different strokes could get them from different folks, it seems to me your research uh, would, uh, would be most informative. I, I, I appreciate it. Now, Ms. Glathney, uh, I must tell you that I am very interested in one stop. And let me tell you, the Department of Labor initially funded the work of the Commission on Black Men and Boys. It was an initial $100,000 grant. It was very important. We worked with the Joint Center for Political Studies to get started in all of this work. Uh, and what interested the Department of Labor was, of course, what they also fund, which are these one-stop centers. But I'm interested in a different kind of one-stop center. It, it may take somewhat from what, uh, from, uh, from uh, Mr. Quander's testimony. Uh, the testimony here today has uh, told us, if nothing else, that there is no magic bullet. Uh, and thus, the one-stop center has special attraction if you're trying to deal with these issues. The Joint Center report, and they, they, they issued a report uh, in the initial phase here, found uh, that it was easier to draw girls and women to government programs than to draw men and boys. And if, if, if you think about it, that, that m won't seem so strange. You know, the street culture, which is so attractive to men, is not found exactly on the inside of, of, of programs. Uh, and one of the things that we think programs are going to need to do is to learn how to get out into the street to where their constituency is. That aside, let, before you get there, your one-stop uh, testimony uh, is very intriguing to us. For example, the kinds of, quote, programs we don't think black men will come forward to. Among them are programs uh, or habits that are killing the rest of the community, like HIV AIDS. Now, you can have yourself a little HIV AIDS center, and at some point, you may, in fact, get black men to come in, particularly if they get desperate enough. But you probably won't get them to come in early enough for, for, for testing uh, and, 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 other, and in other ways. Uh, our own experience in the District of Columbia is that if you have a center which has something that black men want, they will come to that center. For example, unemployment benefits, uh, jobs or job search. I'd like your uh, advice on whether you, whether you believe a one-stop center which had unemployment benefits, job search, job advice, but also happened to have in it uh, personnel who would deal with parenting, personnel who would deal with health issues, uh, mental and psychological health issues, HIV AIDS, uh, would deal with the kinds of, of issues that face black men and they only face when they become terribly serious. Do you think a multipurpose a uh, one-stop center of that kind would be useful given the testimony you've heard today? Well, I, I, uh, my, my experience, I would say yes, just uh, based on uh, our research suggests that when you put everything in one place, if someone can get everything that they need in one place, then they, th there may be services that they hadn't thought of or intended to use that make themselves available to them at that, at that place. And there are places across the country where one stops have actually incorporated um, those type of services, Detroit uh, being one. There are several in Washington, um, in the Washington area. Um, there are some in California. There are some in Texas. Um, that, that incorporate the, 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 whole, the holistic approach to not just getting a job, but the other to work issues. If you, if you have health issues, you can't work. If you have transportation issues, you can't work. Those type of things. So 
I would say yes, that um, if the, to make the center as attractive as it can be to all customers, to, to try to provide the, the types of services similar to uh, the, the big supermarkets that put everything that you could possibly think of in the supermarket so you can go to that one place and get everything done that you need to get done in one visit as opposed to several stops along the way. Well, you, your, your testimony is very important for us as we think that this matter through because the uh, commission, the D.C. Commission on Black Men and Boys has shown a deep interest in putting the services that black men may not come to get in with the services they come to get. And, and one, of the, one of the items on the action agenda is to go to the Department of Labor and try to, try to seek funding from them and perhaps other federal agencies uh, in this way. Uh, uh, Chairman Davis, who is such a good friend of mine, uh, as he says, even when you know he's wrong on vouchers that I'm right on public schools, <laughs> uh, this is a truly good friend of the District of Columbia. I mean, he's, the chairman is working with me now uh, as a Republican on getting uh, voting rights, full voting rights, at least in the House, to district residents. So when I approach the chairman and and ask for this hearing to ask him to put it on the agenda, it is typical of his extraordinary generosity that he unhesitatingly said, uh, yes, I'm not going to, there are a zillion other questions. He has been generous with his time. I'm not going to ask uh, more questions. We are going to repair, prepare an action agenda, and the staff of the Government Reform Committee that's been so helpful to us may wish to propound questions to each of you, and I would ask that, that uh, you perhaps be available to answer some of those questions. I want to leave only with this uh, notion. Um, when the Commission had its uh, hearing, uh, Mr. Stark may uh, remember as the chair that he raised the issue at that very first hearing of alternatives to sentencing when African American men were before a judge. And he raised it because before us was Judge Reggie Walton, who had been the D.C. Superior Court Family Division head of the D.C. Superior Court Family Division had just been appointed by President Bush uh, as a U.S. District Judge. Uh, and at that time, we learned that the judges did not have before them information about programs such as Mr. Stark's program. Uh, when dealing with Mr. Quanda's uh, dilemma, uh, there is no real alternative to keeping people out of incarceration altogether. The mandatory minimums, uh, which confine black men for nonviolent drug crimes, are completely killing the African American community. As much as we need to deal with the symptoms, we've got to go back to that original hearing that Mr. Stark uh, left us with. Uh, and, and of course, with the round of the whole round of ways to prevent incarceration, but even at the point, at the point when you can catch a young man before he goes into prison, up to that very point, we have got to work to keep that from happening. If you come out of jail and you are a black man, and in addition the word felon is on your forehead, I do not know what this society is ultimately going uh, to be able to do. So, so your testimony has been most important in that way. And I want you to know that at the bottom, I'm the mother of a son who does not pat herself on the back that she raised a good son. And he is such a good son. I know good and well that it had everything to do with having a mother and a father in the house. It had to do with my wonderful mother-in-law, Mrs. Norton, uh, who was always there for us, that extended family. Uh, I know good and well that, and that it didn't even have to do only with the fact that this is a very good boy. It had to do with what for luck was available to him, was available to me and my three sisters, and is increasingly unavailable to an entire generation of African-American uh, families and especially men. And I'm going to add, one of the questions that we're going to ask you in writing is going to be the perhaps the most difficult of all. I will just say it for the record. 
in whole sections of our community and increasingly uh, in the society at large, marriage has gone out of style. If you believe that marriage is good for children, that is to say based on the millennia of evidence, the, my question is this. If we let in the African American community so much water roll over the hill with people having children without even thinking about marriage, particularly young men. Young women tend to think about it and want it. Uh, even if we get to the point where opportunity is available, uh, even given the fact that for many young African American middle class men, men opportunity is available, if in fact a cultural norm develops of having children without fathers, will we build that in to uh, the life of the African American community? What I'm asking you is, if this becomes an acceptable way to have and raise children, at some point will it matter that in fact uh, some uh, members of the community, uh, in fact, have opportunity. Will marriage just not be the cultural norm in our community? And if that happens, have we not broken faith with more than 200 years in this country? Is there a way, even short of finding jobs, to make sure that the cultural norm of at least desiring marriage with children can remain intact in our community. Mr. Mr. Chairman, you see that I did you the favor of not asking for responses to that, but I had to get it off my mind. <laughs> well, thank you very much. L let me thank all our panelists. I think you've all added richly to the record, and we'll come back and assess it. To maybe there'll be a legislative outcome um, as well. But we appreciate it, Ms. Norton. Appreciate your leadership in putting this commission together and having them come up and uh, give us a status on that. I appreciate the other commission members who didn't testify today, but for your service on there. I think we're doing it to try to make a difference. Mr. Chairman, could I, could I ask that a letter from uh, Benjamin S. Carson, the uh, famous uh, black surgeon uh, at Johns Hopkins University who wrote us concerning this hearing be admitted into the record? Without and that, objection. And that so the ordered. written testimony of all the witnesses uh, be accepted into the record. Thank you. I would do that. Could I ask that, uh, could I ask unanimous consent to keep the record open? Uh, without objection, so ordered. Again, let me thank all of you for taking your time for your, your service and uh, testifying here today. Um, and the committee stands adjourned.
Later today, live coverage of two discussions on the Middle East. First, a look at possibilities for democracy there. New York Times columnist Thomas Friedman joins international scholars for this event at 2 p.m. Eastern. And at 7, U.S. policies towards the Islamic world, a discussion featuring a retired U.S. general.